fine. We've got got a lot of the well, the East Coast and beyond. Cool. Hi, Tanya from Wyoming. I think you might be traveling the farthest so far. All right, guys. Well, it is 101. So we are going to go ahead and get started here. Um, one second here. Make sure I close these windows so we don't hear any random notifications in the middle. Um, well, guys, um, welcome to today's Teach Me How. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. My name is Juliana Thomas. I'm the Director of Volunteers for AMA Richmond. On behalf of our board, I want to thank you all for joining in. Um, we're thrilled to be able to provide uh, webinars while we're not able to meet in person. We hope you're all staying safe and healthy and hopefully not too stir crazy. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely am. Um, a few housekeeping items to get us started. Um, we're recording this webinar. We'll send the recording to everyone in the next day or so. Everyone has been placed on mute. So if you have any questions during the presentation, go to the Q&A section and raise your hand and we'll unmute you during the Q&A portion of the webinar so you can ask your question or if you feel more comfortable, you're welcome to just type your question in the chat box and we can get to it that way as well. Um, we'd love to hear from you on our social media account, so please be sure to tag AMA Richmond on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn, or all of the above if you so choose. And now I would like to introduce our speaker, Andrew Miller. Andrew co-founded Workshop Digital in 2015 and serves as the VP of Strategy. After growing up in the suburbs of Atlanta during the 1980s, he decided it was time for a change of scenery and moved north to attend the University of Richmond. Armed with dual degrees in computer science and Spanish, it made perfect sense to seek, uh, to seek another course change and begin a career in advertising and marketing at the Martin Agency and later CarMax before venturing out on his own in 2007. By day, Andrew gets to tell stories with data and share as much of Workshop Digital's secret sauce as possible. By night, he's a PE teacher, shop class instructor, and Spanish tutor. You guessed it, he's quarantined at home with his kids. And like many of you, he is also using his time at home to learn new skills like patience and gratitude. Me too, Andrew. Totally with you there. Uh, a few words about Workshop Digital. Workshop Digital exists to build a better agency for their clients, their team, and the marketing industry at large. Their collaborative approach is designed to educate clients to become better marketers. The Richmond-based agency provides handcrafted SEO, PPC, and CRO strategies that help brands find their next customer online. But they know that success is more than search rankings or ad clicks. It's about establishing a foundation for leads, sales, and long-term visibility. And now I'll hand it over to Andrew. Thank you, Juliana. It's great to be here. I guess here, wherever you are is here. And uh, I, I miss the fact that we can't do this in person, uh, but I love the opportunity to present over a webinar and we can, we can still congregate online or offline. And I would love to make this a conversation as well. So if you have questions, use the Q&A, as Juliana said, or uh, we can have a conversation afterwards. Or if you want to follow up, you can find me on email. It's andrew at workshopdigital.com or LinkedIn or Twitter. And we'll carry the conversation forward because I want to share some of our stories and some of our learnings here with you guys today and then keep the conversation going. So at the end of this, if there's anything you see that you like or you want to learn more how these tools can be put to use for, for your brand or your marketing strategies or your competitive set, uh, send me an email. Again, andrew at workshopdigital.com. And we're going to draw a name at random from anybody that, that raises their hand and hopefully more than one and get some of these, these competitive analyses going for you and, and actually turn out a, a report or an analysis of your competitive set based on some of the things we're going to share today. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And if you can confirm this works, Juliana, we should be ready to go. Yes, sir. Looks good. Perfect. Okay. Uh, no, that is not my ankle, uh, but that was taken in our office. We have, a, uh, we have an awesome team here at Workshop Digital. We're about 25 people normally headquartered in the heart of downtown Richmond, Virginia, but we are all working remotely and 
productively from home these days, as I hope you are, and, and staying safe, still be productive and, and practice that patience and gratitude. Uh, it comes in handy more often than I care to admit. So today we're here to talk about digital marketing forensics and competitive analysis and understanding how you can adjust or build a comeback strategy uh, for your brand or your company based on what you're observing among your competitive set or the industry at large. Uh, so this is meant to be uh, a summary of some of the tools and methods that we use at Workshop Digital to inform our client strategies and help them understand when it's a good time to invest more, when it might be a good time to pull back, and some of the do's and don'ts uh, that we advise on a regular basis to help you become better marketers and understand where, uh, where there are opportunities and where it might be wise to sometimes sit back and, and practice a little bit more of that patience. So a lot of the conversations that we have around competition start with an ask from a client. We need a competitive response strategy. This is not a generic made up quote. This is a, an actual quote from a, an actual client. And the, the, the can of worms that this opens inevitably every single time is familiar to most of you in this, uh, in this community. We know that there are lots of competitors, right? We, we have competitors we've identified, but we, we need to understand which competitors you're talking about. So that's going to inform our strategies along the way. So our journey today is threefold. We have a couple of stops. We're going to talk about how your competitors, especially online in the digital space, are not always who you think they are. And once you understand who your competitors are, it's not going to tell you what you should do about it. And then finally, you've got to use data and not just opinion or instinct or intuition to make better decisions, especially now when all of our precedent and all of our best practices and historical context have been thrown out the window. Uh, we have to use data and we have to use this information to inform our decisions about when we can be a little bit more proactive and when we need to, to pull back a little bit. So first question, we do have a poll. We want to start to make this a little bit more interactive and since we can't do a show of hands in person, uh, the first question I'd love to get some feedback on is, are you actively monitoring your competitors marketing activities? And you can interpret that however you want. Ultimately, yes, it helps you stay one step ahead. No, you trust your own plans and you've got a plan that you're sticking to. Uh, and it's perfectly fine to say we don't have any competitors or we don't know who our competitors are. And uh, we'll give a, the responses a second to roll in. Good, yeah, thank you guys. We, uh, we have about, uh, let's see, 40 plus responses right now. And I don't know if you guys can see the results or not, but I'll read them off to you. 70% of you, about, about 31 out of 45 are saying, yes, monitoring your competitors' marketing activities helps you stay one step ahead. It's about 70%. 29% um, are sticking to their guns and owning their strategies and not looking back. And then there are, uh, there's one of you, 2% or 1% that says, what competitors? I don't have any. So great. I think we're, we're in a good spot here to, uh, to continue. So I'm going to click end poll, see what that does for us, see if I can share the results back to you. And of course, we'll report these back out later on. Okay. So helpful to know, we're, we're starting from the same context. We know that competitors' activities are important uh, in some contexts and not so much in others. So let's start with our, our main premise, right? Our first point here is your competitors aren't necessarily who you think they are. Um, those of us that run service-based businesses are gonna have a different view of our competitive set than the people that run uh, bricks and mortar locations or have multiple uh, geographic footprints or uh, even more so than somebody that exists only online in the digital space. Your competitive set is gonna look completely different. And so a couple of examples. If you're a restaurant or a bistro or coffee shop, you know just by looking down your street who your main competitors are, right? In a, in a more traditional sense, maybe going back a couple of months or more, it's easy enough to walk down the street, knock on doors, get to know your competitors and, and make it a little, bit, uh, a little bit more cordial. So if we zoom out from the street view and we look at our lovely skyline of Richmond, if you're a, a law firm or a marketing agency, you can look across your entire city and, and establish where your competitors are. And um, for those of you that are not from Richmond, this is, a, this is our daily view. It's, it's beautiful here. You should consider relocating here. Uh, if you're working remote, come on and hang out and, uh, and take in some of the sites. But we know our competitors locally, everybody in their, in their service-based business should know who they're competing against in their backyard. But what about here? 
what about when you go to a Google search results page and you're, you're, you're bombarded with a list of links and images and next pages and search, more search results and ads. Now imagine yourself in your customer's shoes, right? There's a lot of information in there and there's a, there are a lot of options to choose from. So I wanna make, make the point that every single other link on this page is a competitor in some sense, right? And maybe not in the same product or service space that you're in, but they're competing for eyeballs and they're competing for your customers as they have to navigate the, the noisy search result every time they're searching. So to, to bring everybody up to speed, we know how a Google search results page is formatted and I pulled a few examples to, to draw some comparisons. Most of us are used to looking at the Google ads or maybe scrolling past them. About a third of us, a quarter to a third of us and on any given search query will, will click on an ad. So it's, it's not insignificant. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of folks are focused mainly on the dark blue highlighted spaces here, the organic search results. That's the main bulk of a Google search results page. That's where you're finding your, your content, your information as you're making an informed decision. Uh, and that, that site or that section of the search results could be populated by a lot of different types of sites, which we'll dig into in a minute. And then finally, and increasingly, we're seeing search results page features or SERPs. We call them search engine result pages. If you're in the know, you call it a SERP. Uh, this can include, uh, people might also search for, you might also be interested in. It can include videos, images, news results, uh, links to other searches that you could be performing next. But basically it's Google's way of saying, here's something other than a blue link for you to consider. And in a lot of cases, and again, increasingly, you're competing with Google in their own search results for their own products and services. So all this to say, I wanna broaden our context for what a competitor actually is and who we need to consider as our competitors. Okay, so we have to start there. We have to start to identify the competitors. And once we do that, we're going to talk through how to do that in a moment. Um, once you've identified who your digital competitors are, it doesn't tell you what you need to do, or what you can do or should do to, to counteract them or outflank them or uh, follow their lead into a new market, for example. There's ways to, to kind of co-opt your competitor's marketing as well. So uh, all of the tools and methods that we're gonna mention, and there, there are uh, 10 or 12 of them coming up, I have links to all of them. I'll post the links online, we'll share the slides. So don't feel like you have to take exhaustive notes. Uh, but if there's something in here that scratches an itch that you have, in your company, I would encourage you to check out these tools as most of them have free trials or you can run some demo data through them. And, and if not, reach out to me. We have accounts with, with all of these tools and I'm happy to run some reports for you just to show you what they can do. So let's get started. We need to understand who our competitors are and what we can do about it. So I don't wanna make it sound like the only answer is software, right? We don't need necessarily more tools in our lives because software are shiny objects, they get expensive, but they shouldn't replace people, right? And in my argument, people are greater than software. If I had to choose between picking a tool or picking a person on our team, I'm gonna choose a person almost every single time because people bring judgment and wisdom and intuition and we don't have to rely on noisy data sets uh, to make some machine learning predictions or inferences so we can actually uh, do what humans are best at, which is making sense of very vague situations. But I want to I want to posit today that software and people go together, right? It's not either or. It's never either or, and we really have a lot to to gain from working together, until software and AI comes and takes all of our jobs, and and we have to become strategists and creatives again, right? That's where we all started as uh, the free thinkers, and we might specialize in our niches, but ultimately, strategy and creative are what are going to separate us from the from the bots. So. Um, let's put our people hats on, but look at some software tools we can use to augment our performance. Okay, so again, I want to make an assumption here that um, all of us in our marketing roles need to monitor websites and online activity of our competitors. That's a, that's a given, but this is, this is backwards, and I hate the way this is phrased um, because it implies that all we're doing is using software to do something that obviously software can do better than, than a human. So let's, let's dig into the insights here person with this software is going to be able to spot weaknesses and gaps in competitor strategy. So I'm going to start to shift. I want to reposition everything as a human before the tools. A human's going to spot weaknesses and gaps in competitor strategies by using tools to monitor websites and online activity. Okay, now we can move forward. So we get our insights. 
you've got competitors, you understand who you're up against, you need to know what they're doing and, and how you can counteract that. Um, these are in no particular order, but we're gonna go through some website tools and then some uh, digital and advertising, competitive analysis tools, and finally some tools that you can actually use on, uh, on their websites or within their content strategies to figure out uh, what their angles may be and what they're hoping to do with that, that strategy that they're, they're keeping secret from you. So uh, first tool that I wanna put in front of you guys, if you're not aware of it, it's called Built With. Uh, it's an amazing success story. It's essentially a Chrome browser extension or plugin, uh, and it gives you on the on-demand visibility into all the technology platforms and the, the technical stack that your competitors are running on their websites. So it's gonna tell you what analytics suite they're running, what remarketing or audience pixels they have on their site, um, what plugins they've installed in their WordPress installation. It's gonna tell you what panel-based audience measurement tools they're using and, and so on and so on and so on. And you can go, you can go very, very deep here. Uh, and all of this gives you a little bit of information about what ad platforms they might be using, how they might be structuring some audience lists or campaign strategies. Um, and ultimately it gives you a running list of when they update their tech stacks too. So you can get a, a, a quick notification if somebody replatforms, for example, or adds a tracking pixel from a, a different advertising platform that you're using or want to use to their site, that might give you a little bit of an insight that they're, they're experimenting there as well. So built with, it's great as a free extension. And then obviously there's a, a paid upgrade that you can invest in if you need to get more information from it. Next, this one's a really cool tool called CRAN. Uh, it's at CRAN.co and it's a, it's a clever name. Don't know where it comes from, but it's a competitive analysis and intelligence tool that does a lot of the grunt work for you, right? If as a person, as a human, our time is limited, we can only click our mouse so many times before it gets worn out. Uh, so CRAN will go and crawl or scrape a lot of products and platforms for you and start to build a profile of your competitors, your identified competitors, so that you can track when they update job listings, for example, or when they have new reviews on uh, a, a, a review website or forum discussions or so on. You can look through the, the breadth of platforms that CRAN is capable of crawling and, and notifying you when things change. And they really do try and they're, they're bringing on some machine learning tools to help you sort through that noise too. So you don't get pinged and notified every time your competitor posts something, you can set some criteria to only be notified when things that matter are updated or changed. So CRAN gets a bit expensive uh, because it provides a lot of value and saves a lot of time but it does allow you to bring more data into your decision-making process and, and strategic planning processes so you can keep better tabs on your competitors' activity outside of their website as well. Uh, generically, I wanted to include in here a powerful tool that we use quite often, uh, and they're, they're called a couple different things. They can be called crawlers or scrapers. Uh, and basically, it's, the, it's a description of a tool or a system that can uh, crawl any website in this context, our competitors' websites and extract information into a database or a spreadsheet uh, or an analysis platform where you can then do whatever you want with that data. Uh, so a couple of examples on the right, you know, if you're uh, a, a used car retailer or you are a classified site, you wanna know what inventory your competitors are running or even how they're pricing, what incentives they might be running or, or what they have in their inventory and where they might be over-indexed in some vehicle categories and, and underrepresented in others. You can use crawlers or scrapers to automatically pull those results for you daily or hourly or weekly as often as you want to build your own database of your competitors inventory and, and adjust your pricing or marketing strategies off of that. Uh, it, is, it is legal if you're not violating terms of service or if you're not intentionally or even unintentionally crashing websites by crawling too quickly or crawling, crawling too aggressively, but it does allow you to you know, respectfully gain some of that intelligence and map out their, uh, their website structures, their inventory structures. And if you wanted to take it a step further, uh, you can use a tool like Screaming Frog down here at the bottom to literally crawl every single web page on their site or within a subsection of their site and pull out all the technical information you might need to understand more about their SEO strategies, for example. Um, a couple of tools that we like in this space, import.io is a great one. If you don't have to be a coder to go in and start extracting information from any website, you can literally point and click in their web app and it will start scraping search results for you or, or inventory pages or product pages or whatever it is you want 
uh, and start to build that database for you on the back end. Screaming Frog, as I mentioned, is a great tool that we use heavily on the search engine optimization side, but it can be repurposed to, to crawl and scrape inventory or products as well. Uh, and you can build your, if you have somebody that's familiar with Python, for example, it's a great easy project for somebody to whip up over a weekend and then kind of roll your own solution to a problem. So scrapers and crawlers kind of round out our tool set in understanding what's going on on a competitor's website. So now we can start to dig in, apply our human brains again. So we can adjust our bidding strategies or our messaging and creative strategies in paid ads by snooping on their campaigns, right? So the tools allow us to snoop, the humans allow us to adjust, leading to insights. So a lot of these are gonna be familiar. I'll, I'll caveat this, this is a short list. Um, there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of tools that all facilitate some of these same, uh, same data collection points. So these are some of our favorites. We could do an entire presentation about just paid search and digital display competitive analysis tools. But uh, for, for most of us that are just dabbling in this space or trying to get a quick read on what our competitors are doing now that they might be doing differently than, than a couple of months ago even, uh, here are the tools that I would recommend. First, if you're, if you're advertising on Facebook, you need to be paying attention to competitors' activity and the best way to do that is now with the, the newish Facebook ads library. So we remember a few years ago, the, the fallout around the electioneering and the, the uh, let's just say less than genuine advertising on Facebook. One of their responses was to build more transparency into their ad platform. So now as advertisers, we can search and look at ads that any brand on Facebook is running. You don't have to be direct competitors. You don't have to have any stake in that company. You can go fully vet and review any brand competitors advertising on Facebook and get an idea of the offers they're running or the promotions or even which audiences they might be targeting and, and how they're flighting their campaigns as well based on the, the date ranges that are running. So you can develop some testing ideas. You can uh, match promotions if you need to, or you can uh, look for new changes in any of their ad copy or, or offers or calls to action or anything else that's going to help you understand like what your competitors or, or customers might be doing on Facebook. So super interesting. Uh, everything under the Facebook umbrella is included, such as Instagram, Messenger, uh, and mobile and desktop as well. So you can sort and filter by all of those options and, and get a sense for what you're uh, what you're up against. Next, in the search space, we like both of these tools. Uh, if I had to pick one, I would pick SEMrush or SEMrush, depending on your, uh, your chosen pronunciation. So these are tools that are more or less doing the same thing as our scrapers and crawlers. They're looking at Google search results pages and aggregating paid search activity. So Google ads, Bing ads, or Microsoft ads these days. Um, as well as organic search results and putting them all into relatively easy to use charts and graphs and tables so we can track competitors spending their keyword lists and where they overlap with our strategies relatively easily. Uh, and again, go out and look for any brand uh, that we would be interested in and then start to build custom reports as well so we can, we can track uh, trends and changes over time. The, the big caveat here for tools like this is because they're, they're, crawling and scraping search results pages, we look at these as very directional, but not precise. They're not accurate enough to uh, definitively claim that Salesforce is actively bidding on, you know, 19,000 keywords and they're spending 1.2 million a month. I'd say use that as a relative indicator and compare it to your keyword set, your traffic cost in the same tool and use it as an index more or less to see if your competitors are generally spending more or casting a wider net than you. Uh, and then you can start to really understand how they're, they're stacking up and where they're targeting that you might have some gaps in your strategies or vice versa. So uh, SEMrush and SpyFu are both free to run some basic reports. Once you wanna unlock more functionality, obviously there's a paid subscription model there as well, uh, but it's great for just a quick gut check. All of us in the Google Ads space are familiar with Auction Insights. It's a report you can run in Google Ads within the Keywords section. And it allows you to see your, your most frequent competitors' ads overlapping with yours in search results. So in, in this example, this is, this is live data. This is a competitor, a couple of competitors, the blue and orange 
trend lines here, bidding on our, our clients' brand names, uh, and we can start to see and correlate their aggressiveness in, in the brand bidding space uh, and how that correlates to a rise in our cost per click and our cost per acquisition as we're, we have to outbid competitors for our own brand name. Uh, auction insights are free. It's, it's great data. It's not always um, exhaustive. You don't get every click from every competitor, but it does give you, again, a, a high level directional sense of who's bidding on the same keywords as you and then how you, how you rank compared to them where there might be some opportunities to spend more to to gain some share of voice or share of search and where you could pull back and save some money and re reinvest it in other areas that aren't as competitive. Uh, so it does allow you to, to really get some of those insights and track changes over time. And it can be one of those early warning systems that allows you to see when a competitor is bidding on your own brand names. Moat. Moat is a, a, a beautiful tool that uh, does the same thing as some of the others, but it does it with display ads. So Moat allows you to Again, plug in any brand and, and they have a generous free option. Uh, so you can track display ad creative across a wide variety of ad networks and um, DSPs and they're aggregating all of that information and, and they will sell you a premium package if you want it that trends it, correlates it to other market changes and so on. But I just like looking at the creative. I like finding inspiration uh, for ad copy and imagery and calls to action and potentially seeing offers that your competitors are running to see how, again, your, your campaigns are comparing. And you can break it down by device. So you can look at desktop or mobile devices and, and see if they're adjusting their strategies in any meaningful way. So moat.com is a great visual representation. Typically, you know, it's not providing any metrics. It doesn't tell you how many impressions are running. It doesn't tell you what audiences they're targeting or how it compares against your digital display buys. But it does really get people's competitive juices flowing, right? If you have a, a, a stakeholder or a client or a chief marketing officer that has an itchy trigger finger when, when your competitors are doing something big and bold, show them something like this and just show them the breadth of, of content or creative that uh, your competitors are running. And I guarantee you it'll get a response even without uh, having all the data and metrics behind these campaigns. So finally, content. Uh, we need to know what our com competitors are focusing on in, in their content strategies or in their SEO strategies, and, and we look at those as being closely aligned. Uh, so again, we can use software to track their organic search strategies or their content strategies and, and search rankings and, and so on, and infer some uh, changes to their their strategies over time. Again, leading to insights that we can use to adjust our own. First, uh, stat. Stat, ugly name, ugly interface, but great tool. And one of the most powerful tools we have in our SEO arsenal at Workshop Digital. It's, a, it's now a uh, subsidiary of the Moz brand. If you, if you guys are familiar with SEO Moz or now Moz, they purchased stat uh, within the last year or so, haven't made any significant changes yet, uh, but it's a really cost effective way to track changes in Google or Bing or Yahoo search results for any keywords that you want to track over time and trend and start to break down results based on the searcher's geography or the keyword type or the search results type and, and so on and so on and so on. It gives you a lot of intelligence about where you might be rising or where you might be falling in the rankings. So, Rankings data alone is not enough to, to change strategies. Obviously rankings matter to some degree, but the, the, the caveat here, the extension of this tool is to compare this to your own analytics data and your own conversion data on your own site to see if these trends are reflected in actual user behavior. So this is kind of meant to be an early warning system that some things could be changing in your website analytics based on any changes to search results. Uh, and you can measure the downstream traffic implications from that in Google Analytics or Adobe or whatever it is you're using to, to track that on the back end. Next, Ahrefs. It's a, again, funny name. I don't know where people come up with these, but uh, we've, we call it Ahrefs. Some people call it Ahrefs, Ahrefs, Ahrefs. It's Ahrefs. It mirrors HTML code in my mind at least, so it makes sense to me. Uh, this is a primarily uh, a link tracking tool where you can 
view all the websites or as many of the websites as possible that link to your competitors, right? So in a competitive context, you might be interested in understanding how your competitors content or websites are being linked to from other places on the web. So either you can go after those links yourself uh, or you can build similar content that's going to help you attract more links therefore bump up your search rankings in Google and Yahoo and Bing. So you can seek out those, those opportunities by running gap analysis reports and looking at changes and trends over time. And, and again, using it as a directional kind of wayfinding uh, navigation point, not necessarily the, the end result of a, an SEO strategy. And the best optimized site and the most technically correct site aren't gonna matter if you don't have the right content on it. So, um, Great content generation tool, competitive research tool is BuzzSumo. If you're not familiar with this, it's, it's been around a long time in the, the content space and the SEO space. Um, what it does really, really well is aggregate social engagement for different content pieces around content on your site or on uh, very public sites, your competitor sites. And it really gives you that insight into what's being shared, what's being talked about, what's driving that engagement. Uh, and where there might be some breakout hits or where there might be some opportunities to go uh, create some engagement around a piece of content. So in this case, I just pulled a quick report on Investopedia. They, they create a lot of kind of buzzworthy content and, and link baity type headlines, uh, but they do a great job driving social engagement. And from this report, it looks like their, their primary engagement mechanism is Facebook, which is, which is not surprising, but you know, if they were a client of ours, there's obviously opportunities here to uh, to extend into Twitter. Um, Pinterest is probably not a great fit for uh, an investment website, but Reddit certainly would be, right? There's active, active subreddits and groups in that social community as well that, that would love this content if it was positioned properly. And so that would be another opportunity to gain eyeballs and, and track down where your competitors are or are not active. Uh, and you can obviously, you can use this tool to mo monitor your own brand references and mentions and any sort of buzz around that. So those are the core tool sets or tools in our, in our tool set. Um, there's a few others. I put them in a lightning round. These are all familiar as well. These are more or less review sites or other aggregators of content that can be very insightful in figuring out where your competitors are focusing on either hiring or uh, service delivery and where they might be missing the mark. So you can look at job titles. You can look at reviews from customers or employees and figure out, you know, are they investing heavily in their own customer or employee engagement and satisfaction? Are they hiring in key strategic roles? Uh, and where might they be misfiring? So again, those can be, those can be tremendous opportunities to, uh, to gain share or gain uh, some visibility against a, a competitor that might, might be more entrenched, but will still have some weaknesses. So I think we could do an entire presentation on any of these, especially Glassdoor, if you're on Glassdoor. Uh, it, it can be the greatest thing in the world or the worst place to ever, <laughs> to ever look on the web. Just depends on your perspective and what you're trying to get out of it. So those are the tools. We have another poll question. Uh, the second question is looking over the last 60 days or so, have you adjusted your marketing budgets? And I would include strategies, uh, marketing budgets or strategies during the, the pandemic period. This is a, a simple question. No, business as usual, haven't made any big changes. Yes, I'm spending more on marketing. Maybe there's opportunities you can capture. Uh, or yes, you're spending less on marketing. So we'll give those a minute to roll in. Right now we're at about 50% spending less on marketing and the other 50% is split evenly between business as usual uh, and a quarter of you are spending more on marketing, which is, uh, is actually very similar to what we see across our client base as well. We have uh, about a quarter of our clients that have pulled back in some way, shape or form in their overall spending. Um, some are spending significantly more and they tend to be in you know, the online education space, financial research, um, or anything that is gonna allow people to shop or buy from home. Those are, those are uh, high growth areas at the moment and uh, about a third of you are business as usual. So um, really interesting results. I'm going to share these out so you can take a look. Uh, these are uh, these are good insights as well, right? We're, we're seeing 
some really big shakeups in uh, in our client sets, and it's no surprise that that's kind of mirrored here in this group as well. So thanks for sharing that. Okay. Uh, all right. Last section. We're going to be on the home stretch, and again, uh, I will I'll hit you up for questions or Q and A. For I think we're coming in about on time, and we're going to have some some good discussions hopefully following this. So you've got your data, you've got your people. Um, let's talk about how you use that and make some better decisions, right? The first thing I want to share is an example of how we've done this uh, at Workshop Digital. It's a, it's a mini case study and how we would extend that to, uh, to actually make some data-driven decisions. And we're going to focus primarily on the financial uh, services space or more specifically financial technology or fintech um, and try to answer a question that a, a lot of financial technology or fintech companies have, which is how do they gain share or gain visibility in search results uh, that seem to be stacked against them in favor of local uh, local retail banks or or companies with a physical presence. So competitor, here's the, here's the case. Uh, the brand is a financial technology company. The competitors are numerous. Uh, so let's dig in and see what we can learn. First, we have to understand uh, consumer behaviors, right, and trends in those behaviors. So it's pretty easy to go out and find these stats. Google publishes them quite frequently. Third-party research companies public, publicly share a lot of their data around uh, growth and changes in search volume or search patterns. So it's a starting point for us. And real quickly, we can see that a lot of searches and a growing share of searches are locally focused. People searching for uh, keywords and modifiers like near me or uh, you know, in Richmond, Virginia, for example. Uh, as we're conditioned to search more specifically to our needs, we're also making some assumptions that Google or Yahoo or Bing know where we are. So we don't necessarily have to type in our zip code or our city and state anymore. We can, we can assume that Google is going to share and show us the results that are most relevant to us where we happen to be at the moment. Um, so within the financial services space, these, these patterns are reflected here. And we've seen other research that suggests that after the pandemic, uh, banking customers are actually eager to get back to their bank branches as well. So it's interesting to see, you know, this, this move to digital banking or online banking that we're seeing, and here's a trend line we'll talk about in a second, isn't necessarily shifting uh, consumer behaviors in the long run quite yet, but it's early. So we, we take some of the insights and uh, keywords and, and search opportunity that we see in general market trends and we can start to plot those uh, with data using uh, Google Trends as a data source. Google Trends is a free tool at google.com slash trends. It's one of my favorites. It's about the most real-time information you're gonna get from Google on a wide variety of keywords or topics that you may or may not already be including in your, your digital, digital strategies. In this case, we're looking at a five-year look back window of search volume for online banking keywords and anything related to that topic. So it's kind of an aggregated list of, of online banking related searches. And we can see over the last four years or so, it's been relatively flat. These are all indexed uh, against the highest peak in search volume, which no surprise happened about a month ago. Um, we can see the last four years have been relatively flat. People are pretty accustomed to doing their banking online. We know that uh, digital adoption of online banking is, is growing, but not nearly as quickly as other countries, but it's, it's there. And then all of a sudden you throw a global pandemic into the mix and people are rushing out to find online banking solutions, make sure they can access their funds, keep an eye on whatever they need to keep an eye on uh, online since they can't go into a branch to make sure that they're financially secure or understand their, their personal situation and their finances uh, without having to go to a bank. So really quickly, we saw a, a small dip and then a huge spike as people adjusted to trying to figure out how to bank online over the last um, month to month and a half. And already, just after a few short weeks, we're starting to see the search volume return to the baseline that it was before. So there may not be any prolonged lift in online banking searches or intent, but there is some, you know, there, there are some opportunities here for, for fintechs or financial technology companies that wanted to capitalize on a change in user behavior or search behavior for sure. So we're, we're carrying forward our hypothesis, trying to figure out how a, a financial technology company or digital uh, online banking solution can break through. 
So we have to go to the source itself. Again, we're, we're scraping Google search results here using a tool, um, which we'll share in a, in a moment. It's one of the tools we mentioned earlier. So to gather as many data points as we could, we scraped the, the top 20 Google search results or the first two pages of Google uh, on desktop and mobile devices in 300 largest or markets in the US for a wide variety of uh, you know, financial service related keywords. So we gathered all that into a database uh, so we could start to, to break it down. And the story and the hypothesis turned out to be uh, confirmed is that search results for our financial services keywords are largely weighted towards financial institutions themselves, right? The Wells Fargo's, the, the US banks, PNC's, everything from Capital One here in Richmond down to the, you know, the, a, a two person credit union in a small county in, in West Texas. So all of those are really well represented in Google search results for financial service related keywords, uh, but sprinkled in there that you may not consider are online directories like Yellow Pages and local directories, listings, company listings in, in local markets, chambers of commerce and so on, and review sites like Yelp or Glassdoor or ratemybank.com or, or all of those similar aggregators out there as well. And then there's a tiny fraction of search results across all those markets and all those keywords that are taken up by news sites, uh, other search engines, job listings, governments, .edu's, <laughs> and a not insignificant portion of those search results are food banks too. So Google is placing all of those types of search results uh, ahead of a digital first or digital only provider. That's a, that's a steep uphill battle to climb and that's a lot of consumer perception to change. Uh, so we can, we can start to unpack how that might inform a strategy when you're looking at it against an entrenched set of competitors that go beyond just the, the local banks. So recapping, we use Google Trends to understand search patterns and changes in behavior. We use Google Ads and, and search volume within that to identify which keywords are most frequently searched around the services. Then we use Stat, which was one of the, the search results um, scrapers to track for several days the top ranking sites across all those markets and all those devices and, and database those. Then we can extend that and take Screaming Frog, which is our, our website crawler and go plug in all of those, uh, all of those domains and have our tool crawl every single one of those websites to look for areas where there are similarities, where those sites have strengths and weaknesses or opportunities that we can take advantage of and you know, kind of aggregate some of the best practices or some of the you know, characteristics of top ranking financial institution websites. So this research becomes incredibly powerful. Uh, then you can use a content or social uh, tracking tool or monitoring tool to figure out what content is likely to break through, what content can be developed that is gonna give a, a digital first company an advantage in those areas that they can then either partner with local banks or partner with other content sites to share to gain some of that visibility at the local level where people are searching for, for banking solutions or financial products in their immediate area. So there is a way to take the trends and play those forward all the way through to the insights that will, will hopefully help save a lot of money because you're not gonna beat Wells Fargo at its own game of getting people into its own branches anytime soon. Uh, and really starting to, to find the cracks and crevices in that market to, to fill that need for content. So this is one example, but uh, as a kind of a thought framework, an idea of how to, to think through whether or not it's the right time or the right venue to start competing with the entrenched competitors or with the coffee shop down the street, you can start to ask yourself a few questions and, and come up with a few different ways to think through this. Um, since there is no one true answer and, and without looking at each of your individual competitors and, and opportunities, some of the things that we look at internally and try to internalize are uh, self-reflection first, right? If you're going to compete effectively, you've got to understand your own weaknesses and you've got to treat yourself like a competitor would and look for your own hidden opportunities or, or gaps in your strategies so that if you were to have to defend your, your turf, you're going to know where the most likely points of attack are. Conversely, don't assume that just because a competitor is doing something that it's the right thing to do or that it's even working. Uh, all, all the time we see copycats and we see followers that want to spin up a new campaign simply because a competitor is offering a different promotion or changing their visuals or 
moving to icon-based graphics versus real life graphics or, or whatever it is, we see trends emerge and they become conventions pretty quickly in a lot of cases, but they don't always necessarily work, right? And we see a lot of people jumping on the same bandwagon. So you're gonna have to do some digging and understand what's gonna work for you, for you, for your website, for your, your customers, not just assume that whatever everybody else is doing is uh, a, a easy solution or a silver bullet. So as we're, we're watching consumers and trends, we're looking for signs of a comeback and it's going to vary by industry. It's going to vary by market. It's going to, and it's not going to look the same as it was before. Uh, so I would encourage you don't look for the easy button or an on off switch. Don't just assume that we're going to be able to uh, turn back on the previous campaigns that we were running before. We're going to have to be a little bit smarter and make sure we're building momentum and, and testing our way back uh, as we start to understand more about where consumers are in their journey. Uh, and where they are comfortable spending, where they're not comfortable spending, and when they're going to come back into the market. Uh, conversely, if you're riding a high right now in your industry or your company is doing great because people are stuck at home and they're either buying more online or they're, uh, you know, they're looking for online education solutions or financial research or products, um, don't necessarily, the, the good times always come to an end, right? But you can learn from it and learn how consumers are going to adjust their behaviors going forward and, and try to take advantage of that as well. So there is no right time to turn on or turn off campaigns. There's not going to be one signal that's going to be the, uh, the, the conch shell from the beach that's, that, that alerts everybody that it's time to move out. Uh, do try a lot of things. Now is a great time. It's, it's a relatively cost effective time to be in digital marketing from a competitive standpoint. A lot of brands have pulled out or, or slowed down their spend. So CPMs and cost per clicks can be cheaper now than, than they were in the run up to the pandemic. Um, so your budget can go farther. You can test more things, you can measure them and see what the response is and then pick and choose the winners and, and put aside the stuff that's not working. And finally, uh, we alluded to this earlier, don't, don't assume that there's only one approach to solving your problem and don't assume that that approach is gonna be identical to what it was three months ago or six months ago or, or 12 months ago last year at this time, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot that's changing uh, in the future for all of us. And the best thing we can do is pay attention to the signs, pay attention to the trends and make sure that we're, we're looking at our competitors, whether they're online competitors, offline competitors in our category or not in our category and really try to tap into what's driving consumers to make the decisions that they're making going forward. So with that, uh, we are, at the end, I hope that was helpful. I saw a couple of questions pop up and I'd love to, to dive into that conversation. Uh, and again, if you have questions or you want to, uh, to have us take a look at your competitive set or run some of these reports for you, I'm happy to. Just reach out at andrew at workshopdigital.com and we'll take it from there. So thank you everybody and looking forward to the conversation. Cool, well, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, that was awesome. I learned a lot that I can't wait to go implement already. Um, so the first question, well, everyone, if you have questions that you haven't submitted to the Q and A box yet, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, and then also if you would rather ask it in person, you can raise your hand and we can call on you. Um, we've already got four questions lined up in Q and A, so that might be your best bet. Um, but anyway, we'll go ahead and start with, um, anonymous attendee wants to know, Andrew, how do you keep abreast of new tools that have launched or that are available? Um, that could be a full-time job in itself. There's a, there's something new launching every day. It seems like, um, but we're, we're kind of big tech geeks and data nerds. So we'll test almost anything. Um, but a lot of the, the new tools we hear about are coming from some of the communities that we're active in already. It's either, um, you know, Twitter communities that we're involved with, you know, SEO and PPC have their own, their own little universes that we play in quite heavily. Um, we hear about it through groups like the AMA. We hear about it through blogs and forums and other newsletters. And really it's just about listening. Um, we tend to be a bit critical too of, of some of the claims, especially around machine learning and AI. It's a really complex field and, and having uh, dabbled in computer science a long time ago, just understanding how difficult it is to apply real honest to goodness machine learning and artificial intelligence to business problems and, and noisy data sets. I would encourage you to test new things, but don't just buy into all the claims about machine learning or AI enabled tool sets. They're, they're really hard to pull off at, 
uh, at scale and, and without a lot of data. So um, that's a great question. Just keep, keep listening and talking to people in your space and asking what they use. People are typically willing to share a tool that's, that's been successful for them. Awesome, thanks Andrew. Next one comes from Leanne. And she says, we sell products throughout the US in the B2B space with a small staff and small budget. Oh, whoops, sorry, someone else just asked a question that moved it down here. Um, let's see. Sorry. Yep, was, which, the small staff and small budget, which tools would you advise us to start with in our competitors analysis? Um, all of the above. Um, I'm pretty sure every tool that we reference today, we can share the list afterwards, has a, a free trial uh, and or just a, a, a way to run a free report or two before you have to sign up or even give them an email address. Um, the kind of the freemium model is, is the way to go these days in software as a service. So all of these companies are interested in giving away a little bit of the, of the, uh, the valuable information in the hopes that they'll convert enough people to, to actually sign up for, for an account. So go use the free tools if you like it. There are plenty of ways you can, you know, justify 20, 50, 100 bucks a month for some of these tools if it's going to save you time. The way we evaluate new tools at Workshop is uh, we, we try to run a cost benefit analysis informally. It's not super critical, but, you know, if, if a specific tool can save our teams enough time analyzing data or pulling data or just doing the manual grunt work of aggregating data, then it's easy for us to justify spending, you know, a few hundred bucks a month on a new tool uh, that's going to save us a lot of a lot of human power. Great. Okay. Well, Jessica wants to know, do you have any favorite free resources? A lot of resources offer great tools, but are not within my organization's budget. Um, well, there's a couple of different ways to get free access to some of these. Um, sometimes they have discount plans. If you happen to be a nonprofit, for example, or an educational institution, um, a lot of these software providers may have unpublished plans that they can hook you up with for a discount or a limited usage. Uh, it's also not to capitalize on a pandemic, but I know a lot of these B2B SaaS companies are offering free or discount access to their plans now for, for companies affected by COVID-19. Um, it's obviously they want to play the long game. They want to sign you up as a subscriber, but they might be more willing to negotiate with you and give you, you know, a month or three months free. Whereas before, you might get a 14-day free trial. So you can ask. I would encourage you to ask. Their sales teams are usually you know, given a little bit of flexibility there to, to discount it for, um, you know, for, for nonprofits. Or uh, if, you, if you play the, you know, the COVID-19 card, you can probably get some discounts there as well. Um, the other less savory option is find somebody that's got access to the tool and just borrow or, or rent it from them. Um, I hate saying that, but it's a reality. It's like sharing a Netflix password. It does happen, you know, we don't do that, but if you're just looking to run one or two quick reports, you don't need to go spend a hundred bucks a month to, um, to, to go pay for a tool, especially if they're gonna lock you into a long-term contract, find a, a friend or a colleague or somebody in an online community that has access and um, you know, buy them a virtual cup of coffee or something, maybe they'll run a report for you. Great, thank you. And then we have another question from an anonymous attendee who says, for companies who are new to competitive intelligence or short on time, what are the top few questions you'd recommend they try to answer or types of info you'd recommend they gather first, assuming it's general lay of the land competitive assessment in terms of understanding how a competitor is positioning themselves, where they're playing and how they're engaging? Yeah, when you have limited time or budget and or budget, um, one of the most overlooked but easiest and cheapest ways to gather competitive intelligence is just to read what they're publishing. Subscribe to them on social, subscribe to their newsletters, um, follow them everywhere you can, you, you know, using a personal email address or a throwaway email address. So you don't tip your hand if you don't want to, um, but just read, spend, spend a little bit of time engaging with their content. And typically that will clue you into what their overarching priorities or strategies are. You know, the tools are nice, but all they're really doing is replicating what you could do um, with a little bit of elbow grease. And I think uh, there's not really one tool that encapsulates all of that intelligence in one place. So you might just start with uh, just following them as a, as a customer might and, and seeing what they're putting out publicly. And then the rest of this kind of digs behind or peeks behind the curtain a little bit 
uh, but it's meant to layer on top of what you can already observe out in the public view. Great. Well, guys, we still have a couple more minutes. If anyone has a last minute question you'd like to throw up there, feel free to raise your hand or type it in Q&A. see Valerie's question about uh, helping out in the travel industry. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure you've heard this story a lot, Valerie. My family and I were on spring break the, the week that everything seemed to fall apart and we were seriously considering just renting a short-term apartment uh, to stay and not have to travel back to avoid some of that risk. And part of me wishes we were still uh, in Costa Rica and part of me is really glad we're back. But I do feel for uh, the travel and hospitality and entertainment industries, the conference industry, I mean, you name it, healthcare, um, if there's anything we can do or I can do to help, please reach out and I will gladly run some reports and at least give you the lay of the land and help you understand what uh, what you can see. And, and I can't promise it's gonna be great news, but it's information and it's data you can use however you like. Thanks, Andrew. Well, it looks like that should wrap everything up unless anyone has a last minute question they wanna throw up really quickly. Um, but just Andrew, thank you so much for being with us today for leading this Teach Me How. It was so helpful and informational. Um, and to everyone out there, thank you for, for tuning in with us today. We hope that you got a lot out of it, as I certainly did. And we hope that you will sign up for some of our other webinars and online content as well. So thank you again for tuning in. Let me make sure no new questions came through. Oh, wait, here we go. OK, Andrew, um, do you do presentations like this for nonprofits? Um. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, here in Richmond, we love getting out. We we go speak with the startup groups. We speak with the incubators. We speak with speak with uh, U of R and VCU marketing groups. We're we're all about transparency and, and kind of preaching the uh, preaching the gospel, as it were. So, if there's something we can do to help, um, you know, share information, we're gonna we're gonna package up the slides and make sure that they're shared afterwards with a recording as well. But um, you know, if, if you're local to Richmond, please reach out and we'd love to come visit you in person when we can. If not, we can always do a, a short abbreviated version of this online as well. Great. And then one more. How often do you recommend checking in on competitors? Uh, uh, great question. Um, some clients that we work with, we're looking at it at least weekly because they have to respond to price changes or, or offer changes. Um, and in other cases, you know, they've got really aggressive competitors that will come in and bid on their own brand names um, or bid on our clients' brand names. And we have to defend against that. And it's almost like a real-time kind of whack-a-mole. Uh, but in most cases, you know, for, for even for our own business, we don't, we don't pay a ton of attention to what our competitors are doing. We may check in uh, once a quarter or so um, just to see if there's anything new. So I think a lot of these tools, you can kind of run at your leisure and go check them out when you think about it. Or is just strategizing or budgeting or prioritizing for the next year or the next quarter. Some of these are just good double checks or, or data points you can use as input. Cool. All right, guys. Well, I think that will do it. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you again, Andrew. Thank you from all of us at AMA Richmond. And we hope you all have a great week. Thank you, everybody. Bye, guys. Take care.